Happy Sabbath, everyone. I want to welcome you all for, to, for joining us for our annual provincial lectureship. Uh, before we begin, we would like to open up with a word of prayer. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Our Father in heaven, we come to your throne of grace uh, this afternoon, always with hearts full of gratitude for the opportunity of community to gather together, reflect anew on challenging ethical issues that our healthcare professionals face today. And so as we do so, as always, grant us wisdom and discernment, and may what we learn here this afternoon from Dr. Fox enrich and enhance our ministry here at Loma Linda University Health. We pray in Christ's name, amen. Again, happy Sabbath. My name is Ishan Ma. I'm the co-director of the Center for Christian Bioethics. I want to welcome you all to our Jack W. Provencia Lecture Series. The Center for Christian Bioethics is the uh, organization that is hosting these uh, lectureships. The Center for Christian Bioethics mission is to continue the teaching and healing ministry of Jesus Christ by uniting uh, clinical service and bioethics scholarship. And to that end, we put on uh, various offerings, such as the bioethics grand rounds, webinars, uh, as well as facilitate wider bioethics con uh, conversations with the Adventist Bioethics Consortium. We also encourage our students and our faculty to actively pursue research and writing projects in the area of Christian bioethics. The Jack Provencia Lecture Series is held annually and it's hosted by their center here at Loma Linda University. This lecture seeks to honor Dr. Provencia's legacy. Speaker for this, uh, speakers for this lecture typically address uh, a blend of topics in the areas of religion, medicine, as well as ethics. The, today, our, our talk will be given by Dr. Mark Fox, whom I will introduce in shortly. He will be giving a lecture for about approximately 50 minutes. Then Dr. Moisey Isaac will be responding to the lecture uh, for about 12 to 15 minutes. And after that, Dr. Fox will be given the opportunity to respond to Dr. Isaac's response. Then the audience will have the opportunity to join the conversation uh, during the Q&A session afterwards. And I'll be running the microphone up and down uh, to, to whoever would like to ask questions and engage the speakers today. So just to give you a brief biography of uh, Dr. Jack Provencia, whose legacy we're celebrating today, the late Dr. Jack Provencia was an emeritus professor of philosophy of religion and Christian ethics on the faculty of religion here at Loma Linda University, where he taught from 1958 to 1985. He was a graduate of the Pacific Union College, Loma Linda University Medical School, Harvard University, and Claremont Graduate University. He's an ordained Seventh-day Adventist minister, as well as a physician. He has served as a pastor in Utah, a missionary pilot in Alaska, and a family physician uh, with his late wife, uh, Margaret, who was also a physician. Dr. Provencia is also uh, an accomplished artist, sculptor, rock climber, hiker, and scuba diver, who first worked his way through school as a shepherd in Utah. Dr. Provencia's vision for integrated religion, ethics, and medicine prompted the development of the Center for Christian Bioethics here at Loma Linda University. And if you uh, come to the center space on, you know, upstairs, you will be able to see uh, many of the artworks created by Dr. Provencia there, as well as the book that he has, books that he has written uh, in the ethics library here. So welcome again to our Provencia lecture series. And now I'd like to introduce uh, our speaker today, Dr. Mark Fox. Dr. Mark D. Fox uh, is an associate dean and regional of the regional campus director of Indiana University School of Medicine, South Bend, where he is a professor of internal medicine and pediatrics. Dr. Fox also serves as a deputy health officer of the St. Joseph County Department of Health. Dr. Fox holds adjunct appointments as a distinguished adjunct professor of theology at the University of Notre Dame. And as adjunct professor for the Richard M. Fairbank School of Public Health, at IUPUI in the Center for Health Policy. 
Dr. Fox received his medical degree as well as a doctorate in religion, ethics, and society at Vanderbilt University. He completed residency training in the combined medicine and pediatric residency program at the University of Rochester School of Medicine and Dentistry, where he also completed his fellowship in cardiovascular uh, epidemiology and preventive cardiology uh, and earned a master's of public health degree. He previously served as associate dean for community health and research development at the University of Oklahoma School of Community Medicine in Tulsa, where he held uh, the Julian Rothbaum Chair in Community Health Research. While in Tulsa, he also served as a medical director of the OU Wyman Tisdale Specialty Health Clinic and associate director of the Oklahoma Bioethics Center. Dr. Fox has a longstanding interest in healthcare for vulnerable populations. While in Tulsa, he established the Heart Improvement Project, a comprehensive cardiovascular risk reduction program serving uninsured patients with increased cardiovascular risk. In addition, he developed a street outreach clinic in conjunction with Youth Services of Tulsa, serving sheltered and homeless youth. At IUSMSB, he developed the Community Health Innovations Program and served as the co-director of the scholarly concentration in ethics, equity, and justice. As deputy health officer, his focus is on promoting health equity uh, through community health improvement initiatives. So we want to welcome Dr. Uh, Mark Fox as he gives his lecture titled, Entertaining Angels Unawares, an Articulation of the Distinctive Virtues of Community Medicine. Welcome. Thanks very much, Yishan, for that generous introduction and for your hospitality um, in welcoming me to Loma Linda University. So it's a profound honor for me to be here as the Provencia lecturer. I was pleased earlier this year when Yishan extended the invitation to have the opportunity to learn a little bit about um, Dr. Provencia's remarkable life and contributions, and then to learn more today about his many areas of accomplishment. Then to see the list of, of speakers who have delivered this lecture in the past is really humbling. I, I number among them some friends and mentors and giants in the field. So, you know, it provokes a kind of a unique mix of emotions for me that include um, you know, a sense of honor to be included, uh, humility to be included among that list, certainly uh, some imposter syndrome, but especially gratitude. So it truly is a blessing for me to be with you, and I thank you for that. I want to begin uh, with a story. I entered the the common room of the youth service agency where we established our street outreach clinic. There was a whiteboard much like this then a long list of names. There was Angelica and TJ and Rachel and Jeffrey. But at the top of the list was a name I didn't recognize. It said squirrel and a dash and said suture removal. So I turned to our community health worker and I said, can you point out who Squirrel is? So I met Squirrel and we went into our clinic area and young man had an extensive scalp laceration and needed the sutures removed. And it was a, a makeshift clinic that operated in the storage room at the back of an adolescent emergency shelter. So not your traditional doctor's office. We had a scale, we had a blood pressure cuff, we had some of the necessary accoutrements. And fortunately I had the equipment to do suture removal. But it was my first encounter with squirrel. I'm taking out the sutures and it appeared to be some newfangled suture material. It was a blue nylon thread, that, unlike anything I'd ever seen. Granted, I hadn't done sutures in an emergency room in, in a number of years at that point. So I thought, well, must be something new. And it was in a pattern that I didn't recognize for many of the suture techniques I'd learned before. 
but it was July and I thought, hmm, poor guy probably went to the emergency room and some intern or, or medical student got a hold of him. And I said, so where, where did you have your stitches done? He goes, oh, I, I didn't go to the hospital. He said, you know, I got in a fight and my buddy told me I needed stitches and I don't have insurance. And I'm like, so, so tell me the story. He said, well, you know, I got in a fight. I got hit over the head with a chair. And since I don't have insurance, my buddy said he would sew me up. He said, well, so t tell me more. Well, we took a sewing needle and dipped it in whiskey and lit it on fire. And then I took two shots of whiskey for anesthesia. And we used the twine, the nylon twine at the top of the dog food bag, and he sewed me up. But then he reinforced it with super glue. So I'm picking the super glue out and getting the twine out. And the wound margins were beautifully approximated. There was no evidence of infection. And he did as well as better than I would have done under perfect conditions. It was my first encounter with squirrel. Um, and I had grown to love and care deeply for this population of homeless youth that we served. But that day, as much as any other, really impressed upon me their resilience and resourcefulness and their ability to navigate circumstances that from a position of privilege, I can't even fathom. And so it's with gratitude to Squirrel and thousands of other patients and colleagues and scholars and philanthropists, um, I owe a debt of gratitude because they really helped shape and form my understanding of community medicine um, and have given me the opportunities then to reflect on that from the perspective of both ethics, theology, and public health. I took care of Squirrel for three years um, before I learned his given name. And our compliance office had a really hard time with, you know, what do we do with Squirrel? I said, well, it's a paper chart. Why don't we file it under S? We weren't billing for it, so there was really no, no other issue in my mind that seemed pretty straightforward, but they, they were disturbed by that approach. So I want to give a little context um, about kind of my background in, in community medicine because it was not the path that I had set out on uh, as I started my academic and professional journey. Um, I trained at Vanderbilt and spent most of my time working with the Vanderbilt Transplant Center and for 15 years devoted most of my academic time to thinking about issues in transplant ethics and policy. And in fact, that was my first introduction to Loma Linda was Baby Faye from 1984. I'm a native of Tulsa, Oklahoma, um, was there through high school and realize as an adult that I really didn't know Tulsa at all. I went away for education and training and first faculty job, really thinking that I would never be back there, not because of anything negative about Tulsa, but really where I saw my professional trajectory taking. So of course, that's a sure sign that every, all the personal and professional and, and other providential planets would align and I wound up back in Tulsa um, to help care for my mother near the end of her life and join the faculty of the University of Oklahoma College of Medicine in Tulsa. That was in 2003. And I, I'm generally a fan of provocative subtitles and I wanted to give this talk the subtitle of a Catholic, a Jew and a Unitarian walked into a bar but it sounds like, you know, um, a bad joke. Um, and I never actually saw these three individuals walk into a bar together. Um, but I want to tell you a little bit about these three individuals who, in addition to Squirrel and his peers, have really shaped my understanding of community medicine. So when I returned to Tulsa in 2003, like other communities, the, the county had been impacted with an economic downturn after the 9-11 attacks with thousands and thousands of newly unemployed individuals who no longer had access to healthcare and, and health insurance. 
It was also in an era where the community was beginning to grapple with its own history of racial tension. So Tulsa was the scene of the largest race riot, was the polite term, race massacre, um, 100 years ago in 1921. Working with collaborators at the College of Public Health in Tulsa, um, they had begun studying life expectancy across the county and the area that had been devastated during the race massacre. Tulsa had had a thriving African-American business community after World War I. In fact, it was known as the Black Wall Street and is reported to have rivaled New Orleans in terms of the prosperity of the African-American business community. Over the course of one weekend, 35 city blocks were destroyed, 800 people injured, and as many as 300 people killed. The, the mortality data that was reviewed in the period from 2003 to 2005 demonstrated a 14-year difference in life expectancy from the site of the race riot across a span of about seven miles to where the medical school was in uh, the southern part of the city of Tulsa. In response to the, the economic downturn that had been experienced, my boss at the time, Jerry Clancy, who was the dean of the Tulsa campus for the med school and a psychiatrist by training, launched an initiative to start a, a student free clinic that ran two nights a week to provide care for the, the uninsured. He had a naive fantasy that all these patients would have acute episodic illness. We, you know, treat their walking pneumonia and pat them on the head and send them merrily on their way. He's a psychiatrist. I'm not sure where he got that notion, but. And of course, they all had hypertension and diabetes and thyroid disease and seizure disorders, as well as mental health concerns. So we very quickly had to pivot from acute episodic care in that setting to provide some mechanism for ongoing chronic disease management and primary care. And it was something of a skunk, skunk works operation that grew very quickly with a variety of non-traditional partners, including the areas, the elementary schools in four different school districts, the community mental health center, um, an ecumenical faith-based organization. Um, and at one point, even the We'd looked at putting a clinic at the bus depot where the metropolitan bus lines connected because our data showed that those traveling by bus waited at the transfer point for 60 to 75 minutes. We never could get through, through that with the city. So that was one unrealized dream that to this day, I still regret. But we developed a, a diffuse network of community-based clinics that Again, we're partnered with, with non-traditional entities for the delivery of healthcare, but given the favorable Medicaid funding mechanism in Oklahoma at the time, we were able to care for Medicaid covered lives and then extend care to uninsured in that community. So Jerry Clancy is the Catholic who walked into the bar. Um, George Kaiser is a Tulsa oil man, banker, philanthropist, um, who's Jewish, who loved the work that we were doing in the community, recognized the need, and is what I would consider a fairly activist philanthropist. And so he wanted to see that grow. Other data from the, from the College of Public Health, in addition to the life expectancy uh, discrepancy across the county, demonstrated the maldistribution of providers. So 40% of the county lived in the area around the scene of the race riot and only 4% of healthcare access points. We identified a, a 30,000 visit gap in access to primary care. Uh, Tulsa has a reasonable safety net of, of primary care clinics but a 90,000 visit gap in access to specialty care. So um, I salivated visiting with Jason Lohr yesterday and seeing SAC Health and the specialty services available at that location. But in response to, to the pressing need, um, 
incredibly generous gift from Mr. Kaiser's Family Foundation that really was a transformational gift to the Tulsa campus of the University of Oklahoma College of Medicine to establish the School of Community Medicine. And that was without probably a clear playbook of what that would entail or, or even a clear understanding or agreement about what we meant by community medicine. But that was an opportunity afforded by Mr. Kaiser's generosity, really driven to respond to the disparities that had been identified across uh, the city of Tulsa and Tulsa County. And so I was fortunate to be in a position and at that time was appointed as the first associate dean for community health, where I was responsible for everything we did in buildings that we don't own, um, and was part of a leadership team that really tried to put some flesh on what we mean by community medicine. But fundamentally, our goal was to align our educational mission, our research mission, our, serv our clinical services, and our community outreach to address the needs, especially of the indigent population um, in Tulsa. So at one point, the, tag, the unintended tagline became cornering the market on indigent care, which is a difficult business proposition to meet. Um, but it, it hinted at where our focus was. And as we refined that, um, that's really where, at least what I articulate as my understanding of community medicine grew up. So on the one hand, uh, you know, community medicine has been defined in a variety of ways. I think it's often used interchangeably with public health and social medicine and community health. And it probably exists along a continuum. I think we have a reasonably clear understanding of public health and many of the other terms get used intercha interchangeably. Oftentimes it's understood as service to a defined population. So a college or university's student health service is one sometimes boring um, example of community medicine. Um, sports medicine for a professional or collegiate team uh, with a dedicated provider is another community where the community is defined by membership in some way. And so that would be an example of community medicine Again, not, not what I'm envisioning when I refer to community medicine. The federally qualified health centers like SACHealth would be another example. They're set up and funded in a way to provide care for under-resourced populations, usually with a defined catchment area and population of need, and are often referred to as community health centers. So that's perhaps a little bit closer. My colleagues in Tulsa, um, in some respects, viewed it as, for lack of a better term, the Starbucks model uh, of medicine. So they wanted to, they saw the biggest barrier as being a lack of access and some transportation issues. So they wanted a very distributed network across the community uh, that would be easily accessible. Um, so with our partnerships with these non-traditional partners, again, um, with clinics in elementary schools, we serve not only the students and faculty and staff at that school, but all their family members and where the school board would allow it to all the community members. It becomes a little bit tricky if there um, are felons in the community and how we provide access and things. So there were some difficult challenges to navigate, but the goal was to be a community anchor um, to the extent that the facilities and the philosophies of the partnering organizations would allow. But again, for many of my colleagues, the, in fact, one of them described his view of community medicine as being, you know, meeting people where they are, where the em emphasis was on the word where. So it was really location-based as an approach to community medicine. So in response to Mr. Kaiser's transformational gift to the campus to, to try to align all these mission areas with a focus on community medicine, however we understood it, in comes the Unitarian. So Jim Walker was the executive director of Youth Services of Tulsa, 
He's since retired from that position. But they ran the adolescent emergency shelter for the county, serving youth ages 12 to 18, and had an extensive street outreach program. And he came and again met with my boss and said, I've heard all this talk about the School of Community Medicine, and you all talk a good talk, but I need you to walk the walk. And he said, I need help with the emergency shelter. He said, the state regulations require that we have uh, a health screening within one week of admission to the shelter. So I need you to put your money where your mouth is and I need your help. My boss had a very hard time saying no. So he said, yes. And he said, Mark, this is community health, figure it out. We had a network of 25 clinics across the community. We had internists and pediatricians and family medicine docs and nurse practitioners and PAs and nurses and MAs. And, and they were all stretched too thin and no one had the capacity to take on this additional clinical responsibility. So I started going to the shelter one evening a week on my way home from work, and I would see the, the admissions that they had, help them meet their regulatory requirements. And I realized that virtually all of these kids had Medicaid and actually had reasonable access to care. There were logistical challenges in how to get them to that care, how to coordinate their care, but they all had a, virtually all of them had a payer source. And the much greater need was in the street outreach population that they served. So the drop-in center where I first met Squirrel was essentially the living room for their street outreach program where kids could come in several times a week, get a hot meal, do laundry, take a shower and socialize and get some life skills, coaching and things. That was the group that were often estranged from their family of origin, had fallen out of Medicaid access, no longer had access to mental health services and, and medications that they might need. That was the great unmet need. So we had an opportunity to extend care to that population. And they began to encourage kids from the street outreach program to stay on campus on the night that I was gonna be there. And among the first handful of patients that I saw from the street outreach program were two that stuck in mind. Um, Squirrel was not one of them yet, but one was a young man who had an abscess from a stab wound from a knife fight, um, who was well beyond what I could do in that setting. But by calling in favors, I was able to get him in the hands of a competent surgeon, get him to the OR, get it debrided, and his outcome was good. The other was a young woman, 17 years old, who was living in a campsite at the river. Um, her type one diabetes was completely neglected. She had no access to insulin. She had no access to refrigeration if she'd had insulin, had completely fallen out of care. And in you know, some perverse twist of fate, I diagnosed her pregnancy at that clinic, which then got her qualified for Medicaid, got her into services, got her back into care from her pediatric endocrinologist and ultimately into housing. Those two stories got back to Mr. Kaiser. And the next week I got a check for $76,000 saying, do something to take care of these kids. I don't know how he arrived at the number of $76,000, but it was the easiest grant that I ever got because I wasn't even the one telling him the stories. So the challenge was to figure out then how to make the best use of this gift to take care of these kids. And the university had a big mobile clinic, Crimson and Cream, the Sooner Schooner 2. Um, I saw Oklahoma football took a beating today at the hands of Texas. So um, the Sooner Schooner is the what the mascot rides around in on the field during football games. Sooner Schooner 2 was the big red RV that was our mobile clinic. I said, great, I know where these kids are living. They're living in campsites at the river. They're squatting in abandoned buildings. They're on the other side of the train tracks. We can take the mobile clinic right to them. If transportation is a barrier, we can provide access to care, you know, unrivaled. Fortunately, one of my close collaborators um, who is 
both smarter and wiser than I am. He's a, I told Yi Shen about him yesterday. He's a lawyer and social worker by training and really diplomatic. He said, you know, it would be really interesting to put together some focus groups and get input from, you know, the, the clients about what their greatest needs are and how we can best meet those needs. So I think he was prepared for that conversation because I think he had an IRB protocol ready to go and we got that in and, and had an IRB protocol for focus groups and talked with the kids. And when I presented the straw man proposal to take this, the clinic to where they were, they're like, oh God, no, please don't do that. And they said, you know, we're all living where we're living illegally. We're squatting in abandoned buildings and you'll, you know, it's a security threat. You'll expose where we're staying and please don't do that. Just park it somewhere and we'll come to you. So in the course of those focus groups, we asked a variety of questions about their access to care and their experience of care. And it was really revelatory for me uh, to get a much deeper appreciation of their experience of care and their alienation from the healthcare system. So by and large, they would not seek care until it just got to the point that it was unbearable. When they sought care, it was almost universally through an emergency room, whether they had insurance or not. So they, they knew a little bit about EMTALA and knew that they could be seen. Um, they felt largely neglected and disrespected in those encounters. Many of the, they described many of the providers as presuming that they were drug seeking and just wanting to rush them out of the emergency room or that the provider had no appreciation for their life circumstances. And they would write a prescription for Avalox for pneumonia for $168 that they didn't have a prayer of ever getting filled. So learning from the kids that we were trying to serve led us to completely rethink our approach, which is how we ended up not funding the use of the mobile clinic. We used the storage room in the back of the shelter as a clinic for about a year and a half until some proper clinic space could be built out. But in understanding more about their experience of care, another reason that they didn't seek care is the first face that they encountered in the emergency room usually was an armed security guard. Many of them had warrants out for their arrest or they had unpaid balances from previous visits and they just felt like they were gonna be found. So they really, they actively sought to avoid um, going to the emergency room again until circumstances became dire. And so that led us to really try to develop uh, a low barrier access point um, for clinical care for this population. So we were focused on, you know, a particular population not defined by geography, um, I guess in some ways defined by their affiliation with the Youth Service Bureau. So not, not the same as a, as a university health service, but it was through the outreach of the Youth Service Bureau that we connected with these kids and provided their care. So I know one of the previous Provencia lectures was Ed Pellegrino, who was a mentor to me as an undergrad and is largely responsible for the path that I ended up taking. So uh, again, I owe him a debt of gratitude, but he is as much as anyone else has written cogently about the virtues of the medical profession. And those you know, often get distilled down to compassion and abnegation of self-interest and phronesis or practical wisdom. And while I think those are important and they reflect kind of the profound asymmetry of power that is occasioned in, in clinical encounters of even the most bland variety, The view I have of community medicine is focused less on the community per se. I think understanding the individual in the context of their community 
it is critically important to understand the values and norms and expectations and challenges. But community medicine, as I envision it, is really a commitment to identify and address the health disparities that affect the populations that we're serving. And so while we're cornering the market on indigent care, my focus was how do we prepare trainees with the knowledge, skills, and attitudes to not only be competent physicians with the patient in front of them, but to understand the data, to understand the nature of disparities, and to be equipped and motivated to try to address the health inequities that they encounter. And so for me, that's the, the nugget of community medicine that distinguishes it perhaps from other types of clinical encounters. And, and so that's the distinctive character of community medicine. In response to the, the disparities identified across Tulsa County and the shortage of especially specialty visits available across the county, we don't have a large academic health center. Um, we had a medical school campus with a clinical practice primarily focused on primary care, um, but we didn't own a hospital um, and there's not a public hospital in Tulsa. And so my dean set a goal of planting a specialty clinic in the heart of Greenwood, uh, the site impacted by the, the race massacre in Tulsa. Um, and I was asked to serve as the medical director for that facility. His vision that was that it would be, you know, a host of different specialties in a patchwork quilt Nephrology would be there two half days a week and neurology three half days a week and endocrinology and without any plan for primary care. And it represented what I came to refer to as the field of dreams fantasy, that if you build it, they will come. And I was concerned that that was not at all the case because of the ways that I had observed the homeless youth population being disenfranchised from care. But as we opened the clinic, I also began to appreciate this phenomenon of what I would call the clinic of last resort. And I say that not in a disparaging way to suggest that the quality of care was lesser than or, or you know, that it was a lower quality of care, but it became, on the one hand, it became the next easy site for individuals with opioid use disorder to fly under the radar and maybe get access to prescriptions um, because it was a new clinic. That was a relatively small portion of what we saw. It also became a refuge for patients who had been dismissed by or fired by other providers, whether it was for drug seeking behavior or other behavioral issues or unpaid balances, whatever. They had been dismissed from other providers. So this was another new place for them to try. But it also became apparent that it was a refuge for individuals who had fired their previous providers. So not that the provider had fired them, but their experience of care was unsatisfactory. Um, with other providers. And so they were, again, you know, they were seeking a second opinion, not for the opinion, but for a different experience of care. And in that respect, it very much mirrored my experience with the homeless youth population. And so we accepted as one of our challenges that it was going to be virtually impossible for patients to be fired from this clinic. We accepted all sorts of what other providers would consider bad behavior. Some of it, obviously, a result of personality disorders um, and other factors. Part of it was just testing. But short of physical violence, um, yeah, we, we sought 
to be a safe place and to work with patients through all manner of challenges um, and to understand the circumstances that would impact their care. So that clinic of last resort phenomenon challenged me to, to rethink kind of the nature of our healthcare engagement. I think the US non-system of disease diagnosis and treatment works fine if you get there. If you can get in the doctor's office or get into the hospital bed, by and large patients in the US are pretty satisfied with their actual encounter with the provider. Getting through the system to get to that point can be painful. <laughs> and so again, over the last decade or two, there's been a lot of attention to the patient experience of care. You know, proposals that Disney ought to run our hospitals and that, you know, the mouse is very efficient at picking your pocket without you making without making you feel the pain in the moment. Um, so how does that get translated to a healthcare setting? Um, I fear that part of that is to uh, limit the impact on Prescani scores of, of patient satisfaction or patient experience of care. So I'm attracted to this notion of hospitality, not in the way you know, the hospitality industry might understand it and providing valet parking and, and making your encounter easy to navigate. And I wanna read a little bit directly from the text because I don't wanna misquote um, this portion of it. Um, so, you know, I fear that there's been a movement to create enhanced patient experiences of care. And I wanna be clear that that's not what I envision uh, by this notion of hospitality. It's, all, it's also tied up in this notion of a medical home. And so I've, I've wrestled with this idea of providing a medical home for individuals who are homeless um, and, and have neither a physical home nor a medical home. So over the last decade, there's been a growing interest in and attention to the concept of a medical home. And the intent of the patient-centered medical home initiative is for each patient to have a provider and his or her team who know that patient well and who serve as a conduit of health information and care coordination. And there are even accreditation standards for qualifying as a medical home. The irony in my mind is that those accreditation standards are focused more on back office functions like referrals and care coordination and where doctors and nurses sit. Um, and so just like if a tree falls in the forest and there's no one there, does it make a sound? If you're a patient-centered medical home and the patient can't tell the difference, are you really a patient-centered medical home? So they delineate more specifically how the back office of a medical practice ought to function than they do on the patient's experience of care. So that is other than requiring explicit policies regarding after hours call coverage that have to be communicated to patient, there's little guidance or requirement that practices adjust to ensure that patients feel at home. So in seeking to engage the medically disenfranchised, community medicine practices often must make accommodations to make patients who have otherwise felt unwelcome elsewhere to make them feel welcome. And so hospitality becomes a dominant theme, again, not in the way we think of hotels or Disney. In, co in contemporary parlance, hospitality often carries the connotation of etiquette and seems commonly associated with the hospitality industry. Both Hebrew and Christian scriptures, however, convey a more radical notion of welcome, focused on diminishing the otherness of strangers. The rationale for hospitality in Genesis stems from the possibility that God may be sojourning as a stranger in our midst. Abraham and Sarah's hospitality is blessed with the promise of a son. 
An alternate rationale for hospitality is rooted in the notion of a debt to be repaid. Duties to strangers in the Old Testament are linked to admonitions that the hosts were once strangers themselves. From Exodus, you shall not wrong a stranger or oppress him, for you were strangers in the land of Egypt. The sentiment is echoed in Leviticus. When a stranger sojourns with you in your land, you shall not do him wrong. The stranger who sojourns with you shall be to you as the, as the native among you, and, she, and you shall love him as yourself, for you were strangers in the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. Likewise, hospitality was a dominant theme in the early Christian church. In Acts and several Pauline letters are references to hospitality. The admonition in Hebrews mirrors the rationale in Genesis. Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. Similarly, while the second greatest commandment is to love one's neighbor, the parable of the Good Samaritan underscores a profound call to the love of strangers. The first challenge of community medicine is to embrace a radical notion of medical home, creating a space in which those who have felt most unwelcome feel invited. The current somewhat inchoate emphasis on trauma-informed care is at least a nod to this goal. And in this context, creating a practice in which the Samaritan encounters respect and is regarded as of value is paramount. So in working with the population of homeless youth and, and trying to be responsive to the experience of care that they described, we sought to endorse both a, a trauma-informed framework. You know, the population of youth that we served uh, had a mean adverse childhood experiences score of four and a half. Um, and 75% of them had four or more ACEs. So, you know, tremendously traumatized population. The fact that they could get out of bed and function, again, is another source of my profound respect for them. And so we, we sought to, to create a low, low barrier access point, which allowed us to take people without identification Squirrel could be squirrel for three years before I ever knew his name because he chose to share it with me. We offered access to services in a site that was convenient to them and acceptable to them. And yet even that wasn't enough. Uh, again, because based on their experience of trauma, they had no reason to trust me. They were generally distrustful of most authority figures. And so how do we overcome, you know, despite our well-intentioned desire to be of service and to offer benefit for these patients, um, you know, the, the mountain of distrust um, was, was greater even than for others who encounter healthcare in more traditional ways. And so we developed a peer community health worker program, um, hiring from the population of homeless youth to, to work with our clinic team. And Tulsa, Oklahoma doesn't get quite as hot as it does here, but the summers are warm and heat related illness is a challenge, especially for people living on the street. One summer I had some medical students working with me and I asked them to put together some tips for addressing for identifying and addressing heat-related illness. And one student dutifully wrote down everything that the TV meteorologist said. Wear light-colored clothing, stay out of the sun during the heat of the day, drink 64 ounces of water, uh, stay in air conditioning. So put together a beautiful handout. I said, Molly, do you know where these kids live? Do you know that none of this is achievable for them? When we developed our peer community health worker program, one of the questions we asked in the interview was, you know, how do you, how do you prevent heat related illness? And Sunny was one of our first community health workers. And she said, 
Here are all the places where you can go fill your water bottle without getting hassled, where you can wait in the shade or in the air conditioning without getting hassled. She had all the street smarts and all the knowledge of how to navigate. So we hired her on the spot to fill this role. And over the course of several years, we had several cohorts of, of community health workers that provided both health education and outreach and some clinical support functions in helping our clinic operate. But they were really our first um, expression of hospitality and they gave credibility to our efforts. So they were the first step in helping to let the patients we were serving know that you know, we were there to serve them and that they could trust us. And so as I think about hospitality, I, again, I worry sometimes that, you know, in, in some of the work from Bretherton with, that's focused on, on otherness, um, often driven by political or nationality or ideological differences. So the focus on the other um, is, is probably different, I would say, than what we encounter with respect to people who are seeking care or in need of care. And often the notion of hospitality, I think gets, um, I don't want, watered down is not the term I wanna use, um, but it is, I guess, a receptive hospitality. Let's make the space that we're inviting you into um, palatable and welcoming. And I think that was, perhaps my first generation notion of, of hospitality in this regard. But as I've reflected on the ways that our healthcare institutions are very often physician centric, they work well if you get into the dentist chair or into the doctor's office. Um, we don't do as well if you don't make it to that location. And we do generally a really bad job at intervisit care, pro progressing someone's healthcare between their encounters in the office or in the hospital. So it requires a more proactive notion. And similarly, I think it requires a more proactive notion of hospitality to engage what is often a, a reluctant disenfranchised population into what we hope is a safe space. Again, we also tried to do that in our specialty clinic, uh, the clinic of last resort um, by hiring people from the community, having a community outreach team, trying to address social factors that impact health, but also through extensive outreach through the schools and the churches and the barbershops and the beauty salons, because individuals who will call and make an appointment are different than the individuals who won't. And part of our challenge was recognizing the disenfranchised who just weren't engaging healthcare at all. So I've mentioned Mr. Kaiser, the activist philanthropist. Um, and again, the, the scene of the race massacre in Tulsa had the highest rates of cardiovascular disease and cardiovascular mortality in a state that's among the highest in the country. So in many respects, it was ground zero for cardiovascular disease. And he said, you know, we know what to do to prevent cardiovascular disease, go make it happen. And so he kind of threw down the gauntlet and said, how, how are you gonna deliver? There's this 14 year difference in life expectancy. Cardiovascular disease is a big contributor. Ready, set, go. <laughs> um, and again, we, we were fortunate to have financial support to put a team together to respond but I was reluctant to accept the, the field of dreams that if we hang out a shingle that they'll come find us. And so we partnered with, a, again, a variety of institutions and did proactive community outreach. Young African-American men don't go to the doctor, but they go to the barber every three weeks and they stay with the same barber for eight to 10 years. Um, so a friend of mine, Ron Victor, who was a cardiologist at University of Texas Southwestern, and then later in his career um, at Cedars-Sinai, 
had really helped me appreciate that insight through his work, working with barber shops on hypertension control. And so we proactively sought to engage people who were disenfranchised. And part of our mistake, I have to admit in retrospect, is that we saw insurance status as, I guess, probably the easiest surrogate marker of disenfranchisement. So they certainly have challenges in, in accessing care. And yet there were so many other challenges. In some cases, there were language barriers. I think a lot of clinics experience that and, and seek to address that. But it's more, again, that the patient experience of care that has made patients feel unwelcome and to feel alienated. And the challenge was to overcome that alienation and provide a level of, of hospitality that gets them in the door. The second part I have tried to characterize um, at, under the notion of reconciliation. And, and I think my thinking on this really has evolved especially over the last several years. Um, so I, I don't think I've got this quite right. Um, and it's something that I'll admit that I'm struggling with, but creating a welcoming space for the medically disenfranchised may be the first order of business in community medicine, but it is certainly not the last. Moral responsibility extends beyond the inviting welcome, but in responding to the alienated other in a manner that not only addresses their healthcare need, Community medicine entails an intrinsic element of justice in seeking to redress health inequities. Beyond a welcoming invitation then must be a fundamental commitment to healing divisions and laying the groundwork for a previously non-existent mutuality. As in the gospel, the work of reconciliation is one-sided and unconditional. Rather than a one-size-fits-all clinical practice, the onus is on the provider to eliminate barriers and to create an environment which facilitates mutual engagement. Sustained engagement for the pursuit of the ends of medicine and health is the goal for an individual patient, but the commitment to social justice is central to the work of community medicine. I think the racial reckoning that our country has been grappling with over the last several years and throughout the COVID pandemic is really what makes me feel the need to, to push this notion of re reconciliation even harder um, than I have initially thought. So in as much as the work of reconciliation is one-sided and freely given, community medicine's care for the disenfranchised may mimic God's grace, though the analogy is constrained in ways not applicable to grace. While access to care in community medicine may be unconditional, that be, may be more obligatory than gracious. Further, the notion of professional autonomy at least poses the possibility of limits that would not translate directly into the notion of grace. It's been suggested that community medicine or care for the underserved is a fulfillment of the exhortation to care for the sick in the corporal works of mercy. And yet all healthcare practitioners could claim to fulfill that call to mercy. Perhaps the response of community medicine reflects a higher order and that it encompasses not merely care for the sick, but also creating a harbor for the harborless. The goal of these corporal works, however, is not rightly understood as penance or even primarily about charity. They are the work required in the pursuit of justice. Rather than being manifestations or imitations of God's grace, the stance of entertaining angels creates occasions for encounters with grace for provider and patient alike. So the, while I, I think there is a call for, again, what I would, describe as proactive hospitality. Uh, I admit that I continue to kind of refine my appreciation of this notion of reconciliation. 
uh, throughout the COVID pandemic, you know, glaring health inequities that have always existed were exposed and highlighted in ways that became impossible to ignore. So even people who would hope to or want to ignore them, I think would have been challenged to do so. In thinking about access to testing and treatment. So as Yishan said, one of my clinical role is with the County Health Department um, and was the interim health officer right at the outset of the pandemic. And so have spent the last two and a half years um, thinking about that at the county level and challenges ensuring access, challenges in ensuring access to testing and treatment and recognition of disparities with respect to communities of color that largely serve as frontline workers and were working throughout the pandemic and more frequently exposed and more frequently hospitalized and certainly early in the pandemic were more likely to die. And then as vaccines rolled out, we're more hesitant to accept vaccination, pose challenges for our community as for many others. And yet the facile response is to have a, a media campaign that shows a black leader with a smiling face getting a COVID vaccination, which is you know, a naive and glib response to trying to overcome hundreds of years of oppression and mistrust. And that's, it's in that vein that I recognize that even this notion of reconciliation, how do we, I initially saw reconciliation as kind of the ongoing engagement in a hospitable place. Um, and over the last several years, I have tried to begin rethinking this, not as, as trying to promote engagement, ongoing engagement in a hospitable place, but really recognizing the fundamental challenge to address not just the, the social factors that impact health, but also the structural factors. And what are the aspects of our healthcare system that don't rise to the occasion and meet the needs of populations that are disenfranchised, whether that be population, communities of color, rural versus suburban communities. So th these disparities arise in different ways and pose different challenges. But the experience, you know, especially, you know, over the last several years, since the George Floyd and other uh, incidents of racial violence um, really call us to rethink our systems everywhere from medical school admissions, since we have an admissions person represented here, um, thinking about how we repopulate our healthcare workforce um, that's more reflective of the diversity of our communities, but also that at least are engaged in struggling to respond in holistic ways um, to meet those challenges, to address the fundamental inequities and fulfill the commitment to social justice that I see as central to the work of community medicine. So I'll stop there. I thank you all very much for your attention and being here. And I look forward to Dr. Isaac's response. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Fox, for sharing your vision and what it means to embody hospitality and reconciliation in community health. Uh, before we move on, it's, speaking of health, I think it's good for us to just stand up a little bit and stretch, uh, do a little bit of a wholeness uh, stretch and break. Uh,
All right, let's get ready for the next part of our presentation. All right, to respond to Dr. Fox lecture is Dr. Moisey Isaac. We're very excited to have him here too. Uh, Dr. Isaac is a new addition to the School of Religion. Uh, we're with a expertise in Hebrew Bible uh, and his recent interest, it, you know, Dr. Isaac has just a wonderful and unique ability to bring biblical ideas and concepts to bear on issues of health equity and justice. So I'm really excited to hear uh, your thoughts on Dr. Fox talk. So Dr. Isaac is assistant professor in theology in the School of Religion at LLU. He received an MA degree and a PhD from UCLA with an emphasis on immigrant identity, linguistic, anthropology, and Near Eastern culture. And his other research interests include healthcare disparities and hospice slash end of life care. So Dr. Isaac, uh, welcome. Thank you all. Uh, good evening to all of you. I'd like to thank the organizers of this uh, bioethics conference, um, Drs. Um, we and Dr. Ma, uh, for this invitation to present a response to uh, the lecture. As I told uh, Dr. Ma, if this lecture goes awry, please blame him. Um, second to Dr. Fox uh, for his excellent presentation and paper. Uh, my comments today are more directed towards the concept of hospitality and not so much to offer a critique of Dr. Fox's important work and uh, as the experiences he has shared, but more broadly uh, to explore some of the methodological assumptions and to bring the data into dialogue with the capabilities afforded by a comparative use of biblical conceptual models as a tool in medicine. So Dr. Fox highlights that community medicine public health is A, inherently moral, B, has distinctive virtues, C, takes the concepts of community seriously, especially as uh, communities values, history, and norms. Additionally, Dr. Fox regards the patient's averse childhood experiences and trauma in the patient-provider relationship as critically important. Most importantly, the cultivation of hospitality and reconciliation to redress health inequities, thereby ensuring that patients feel, quote unquote, at home. Dr. Fox points are excellent and provide significant discussions on the value of hosp hospitality and reconciliation in medicine, but from a limited level of social meaning. This approach has strengths and limitations. The authoritative con concepts in the Bible have exercised profound influence over the description and classification of Christian practice. Indeed, with the increasing uh, prevalence of studies on hospitality and biblical studies, and in medicine with uh, doctors Michael and Tracy Balboni's excellent book, Hostility to Hospitality, and, uh, published in uh, 2018 by Oxford University Press. It is important to be cognizant of the conceptions of the classifications of this term when evaluating any studies on this topic, since even such a listing depends on what is an undefined model. Studies on this topic give the impression that they are working with preconceived, with a preconceived, with the preconceived premise that the social practice and meaning of ancient and modern Mediterranean quote unquote hospitality is inflexible and not fluid or situated in a particular context in space and time. Such reductionism, 
reductionalism has led to the imposition of social categories that completely obscures the, the fluid discourse, discursive semiosis and bleaches performative identities across the chronotopes of the lived experiences of people, especially people of color in America. Seen through this interface, the practice of quote unquote hospitality emerges as a symbolic construct in which both traditional and modern values have been invested. In reassessing Dr. Fox's notions and conclusions, some of the questions that must be posed are, what strategies are deployed to signal hospitality with a particular non-kin guest or group? How do these strategies, strategies align with modern medicine in America, especially with people of color? Answering these two questions gets to the heart of the matter and brings the evidential problem into sharper relief. The challenge of biblical quote unquote hospitality as a concept in community medicine. Unlike the term service, which is technical and easy to describe, hospitality is intangible, abstract, harder to define. There is no unified definition. Indeed, there is no term for hospitality in the Hebrew Bible. It was not something you said, it was something you did. It was not a dictionary entry. It was a lived experience. Hence, it cannot be summed up in a checklist. By contrast, in the New Testament, we find two terms that apply. Um, philoxenia, which means the love of strangers, and xenodokeo, which is receive or embrace a stranger. I maintain that it is better to focus on the social meaning and experience of hospitality. Hospitality, therefore, connotes, in my mind, the ideas of openness and welcome to a non-kin guest who is in need of your assistance and help and must be brought into your space. Hospitality, therefore, is invisible, arduous, and admirable. It surrounds a patient like an atmosphere of relentless positivity. Either one feels it or one doesn't. In the Bible, the traditional Mediterranean societies, like the, the traditional Mediterranean societies, hosp hospitality was not solely a norm of good manners, but a moral institution, which is in distinction to here in America. It was a core part of the social fabric of ancient Israel. Biblical laws specifically sanctioned hospitality towards the Hebrew word ger, which means, or ger, which means foreigner, migrant, displaced refugee, or transient outsider. I avoid the term alien, um, such as Leviticus 19.34. But it was not just the visitor and traveler who often needed immediate food and lodging, but widows, orphans, the poor, and even the Levite who was in your gate. Deuteronomy 14 and Deuteronomy 24, 9. Hospitality in the biblical sense did not refer to hosting of friends and family well, but extending courtesy and, and, and uh, assistance to the ethnic other, the socially disadvantaged, and creating a shared space environment of welcome and a feeling of at home in non-home spaces. Several narratives highlight this practice. For example, Moses uh, whom Jethro hosted in Exodus 2, the prophet Elijah and the woman of Zarepta in 1 Kings 17, et cetera, et cetera. These stories index a core cultural value, but also provide instructions for how to treat other people. Rejecting these values, such as the case of the Gibeonites who improperly hosted a Levite from Ephraim, created a moral disorder and a foreshadowing political revolution. Intentionally rejecting angels, health justice as the overlooked virtue. In its application to American medicine, there are several barriers to the hospitality model. First, who is the quote unquote stranger? And who is the quote unquote host in this model? Who is doing the entertaining and who thinks that they are the angels? For African-American descendants of slaves who have been living in the United States for over 200 years, they have been regarded as the quote unquote stranger and even worse. One could argue that there is an implicit collective ideology of us wealthy white Americans at quote unquote home versus them, the people of color who are quote unquote guests, strangers in their home. 
For many, there is no America to call home or base to even host the other. We have not been accepted or will always be classified as a stranger. For American Blacks and immigrants of color from the African diaspora in Spanish, British, French, and American colonies, the same is the case. In this scenario, the angels are the poor Blacks, Latinos, and other minorities who are not entertained or treated fairly, but knowingly rejected. The improper hosting of African Americans in America, as in the case of the murder of George Floyd and others, will continue to foreshadow political revolution. For Black people in the healthcare system, hospitality is quite a different experience. Up until 1965, or for more than 100 years, Blacks and other people of color were denied treatment at hospitals. Essentially, the notion of hospitality really reflects the discourse of nostalgia in examining how medical practices have changed from the 19th and early 20th century as an idealized model. In this nostalgia discourse, historical medical narratives are constructed through particular ideologies to tell wholly different accounts of the past. This discursive system, one that is fundamentally conservative in nature, takes on the form of purism to the selection of selected traditional medical practices. This discourse in particular reflected among Christian medical advocates who decry the abandoning of traditional American medical values and adopting secular modern ones. My critique is that the application of 19th and early 20th century models is inadequate and even in fact disturbing because hospitals were far from a place of refuge for people of color. It was a time when black people were denied health services. I understand how um, this nostalgic discourse has its strengths, but it is problematic because every race was not welcomed nor treated as a guest. It bleaches the experience and identities of people of color in history. The idea behind the Latin term hospice or hospitalis is to be hospitable with a positive encounter, to receive an invitation, cultivate a relationship, and imagine yourself as a family member. Wherever we go, whenever we go to the hospital, we're looking for hospitality at a time of medical crisis. We are guests seeking a space of caring for strangers. The expectation of good host is to meet the needs of the guests in these spaces. But that has not been the case, especially for people of color. Research indicates that across virtually every type of diagnostic and treatment intervention, Blacks and other minorities receive fewer procedures and poorer quality medical care than do whites. Recent research documents the persistence of these patterns and reveals that higher implicit bias scores among physicians are associated with biased treatment recommendations in the care of black, black patients. Providers implicit bias is also associated with poor quality of patient provider communication, including the provider's nonverbal behavior. To counter this problem, I propose a different model, one that consists of mutuality and kinship hospitality. In Genesis 1 and 2, all humans are divine image bearers. If so, we all have an, to be elevated to a distinct equal status, irrespective of one's economic, ethnic, national, race, or political category. In this model, all have equal status and equal stake as members of the same kinship group. We are all part of the human family and deserve dignity, respect, compassion, and empathy. As a person of color, I want to feel that I belong. I want to feel that experience. I should be afforded the equal treatment as white Americans. I want to feel that I am not a stranger in America, but one who is familiar, not a foreigner, but a citizen, not an outsider, but an insider one who is autochthonous to this town, city, state, country, and even to the human family. I want to um, um, receive excellent medical treatment. And I pause here to highlight my experience uh, having COVID-19. Um, I live in a predominantly community of color um, in Los Angeles. And when I had COVID-19, I called 911 and I was sent to a hospital. Centinella Hospital in Inglewood. And I did not receive the treatment that I thought I should have received. I was discharged several hours later with the same symptoms. I had about 80% oxygen. Um, 
And I knew that when I was discharged that I would call 911 again. Um, when the ambulance came, I requested to go to UCLA hospital. And they told me they could not bypass all these other hospitals, excellent hospitals in the community <laughs> and uh, send me to the hospital of my choice or my choosing. Uh, so they sent me back to Sentinel Hospital. And when I was there, I, I think arrived at eight o'clock at night, did not receive uh, a room 16 hours later, did not receive any medical care. I started doing research to find out, well, what are the medications that are available for, for COVID-19? Found out that remdesivir was available. So I inquired with the nurse, doctor, hey, do you administer remdesivir here? One nurse said, never heard of it. Doctor said, no, we don't do it here. Well, come to find out, UCLA administers remdesivir. Um, so I checked myself out of the hospital, um, signed the uh, verse, uh, against uh, medical um, advice release form, uh, called a hospital transport, paid extra money to take a hospital transport, and uh, went to UCLA. Within 15 minutes, I was checked in. Within 30 minutes, I had my hospital bed. Uh, rather than, well, I can go through all the other details, but anyway, uh, received Rindisavir that night, and uh, I'm here today because of the services I received. But my question is, why was it that at Sentinel Hospital in Inglewood, they did not have Rindisavir, but at East Lay they did? Is it because one zip code is 90210, and the other one is 90043? These types of inequities exist all the time. And while I had the ability to research peer reviewed journals about what is available for medication, someone who was next to me, who was a senior African-American woman who was suffering adverse symptoms even worse than mine, who I don't know had access or even the wherewithal to even do research to find out what's available, was discharged. I don't even know if she's alive today. But her case and many others were prevalent during the pandemic and really were eye-opening in revealing the inequities that exist between communities of color and those that are not. So how can it, uh, hospitality be achieved in community medicine? The concept of mutual kinship hospitality has been embraced by the, must be embraced by the entire medical staff and not simply directed at a patient. It takes every medical doctor, nurse, clinician, service worker, et cetera, the emotional intelligence to make it effective. All must be aware of their implicit biases or biases, practice kindness, compassion, optimism, empathy, and integrity. If not, one will know if it's superficial. As Jesus says, do unto others as you would have it done to you. Moreover, mutual kinship, hospitality, and reconciliation are extensions of compassion. That is to say, these virtues can be placed under the broad umbrella of creating compassion in communities. One does not have to preclude the other. I agree with Dr. Fox's uh, analysis that hospitality and reconciliation is often ignored, moving it from a subset to its own virtue category. This is a good step to redress past wrongs, especially compassion practices that ignore social justice. But the second barrier to hospitality and reconciliation in actual medical practice is its monetary impulse. Community medicine seeks to redress health inequities, but the question remains, how can they do this? I agree with Dr. Fox's mechanism for this change. The onus is on the provider to eliminate barriers and create mutual engagement. It must be one-sided and freely given, quote unquote. But there is a need for policies that require training to properly address and redress implicit biases and institutional racism, interpersonal miscommunication, and public support with financial backing. Unless community medicine works towards reconciliation as a policy, in my mind, it will be ineffective. Its goals will not get accomplished by the voluntary rel uh, reliance of the good graces of select individuals. One must rec recall that it was the Civil Rights Act of 1963 and the Medicare Act of 1965 or policy that drove social change, not idealized talking points of moral qualities that people in power do not put into actual practice in terms of race, equality, 
etc. In the biblical Christian model, God is the motivation for reconciliation. What is it for secular society? Moreover, what about Christian clinicians who do not value or care to incorporate hospitality and reconciliation in medical practice, but are triggered by its monetary imp impulse? Financial profit as a primary motivation for hospitality cuts at the core value it seeks to, to alleviate. To a certain extent, they are mutually exclusive. In the biblical model, guests were not to remunerate the benefits received from the host. This difference is not reconciled in modern medicine. One could argue that it is double-minded or a double-minded model and a contradiction. One will suffer at the expense of the other. The challenge of affordability of medical services persists and policy changes are needed to address these problems. The number of uninsured people of color, Blacks and Latinos in America is very high. In California, California alone, the number of undocumented uninsured workers in California is over a million. One could argue that the VIP medical treatment is currently given to patients in the form of home health and hospice care in residential care facilities for adults and seniors enrolled in medical, Medicare and Medicare, which I have experience in. Doctors and nurses visit patients in their home or private rooms and provide a service. But the challenge persists in the uneven quality of services between nonprofit and for-profit companies. Moreover, even, even in medical, um, excuse me, even in medical um, Medicare coverage, inequities and in health disparities persist among communities of color. Of the 51% Medicare enrollees who used hospice services in 2019, 82% of all hospice enrollees were white and only 8% were black. In some African-Americans, Latinos and other people of color <clears throat> and patients um, of color are not being safeguarded across the uh, board in medicine. And the social bond of protective hospitality is not being extended consistently. This reality has communal implications. More is needed. American society must be enjoined to the virtue of equality through training law and policy. Ideally, this is one way to achieve health justice and for more to experience the VIP medical treatment. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Isaac, for your reflection on the idea of hospitality. And uh, right now I'm giving uh, Dr. Fox the opportunity to respond. Well, first, I just want to thank Dr. Isaac for a really thoughtful and powerful response and, and for sharing his own regrettable experience through the pandemic. Um, I'm glad you had the wherewithal to seek the appropriate treatment. I'm glad you were here today to respond. And I especially appreciate your attention to the, the quality of care. I, I feel like oftentimes in trying to address health disparities, the focus is um, on, in some ways, what I would consider the low hanging fruit of improving access and focusing on outcomes. And the greater challenge is addressing disparities in the quality of care, whether along racial lines or gender lines or other things. And that um, I think requires really a, a wholesale re-examination of, of everything, again, from medical school admissions, medical education and training, and it requires a level of self-awareness and introspection uh, and attention to implicit bias that I think institutions are beginning to grapple with, but, you know, decades, generations, centuries too late, um, but I think that remains uh, you know, a formidable challenge for community medicine as I would hope to see it achieved. But I thank you so much for a really powerful response. And now it's time to take some questions from the audience. Um, I'll be running up the mic to you. If you would like to ask a question or make a comment, please raise your hand. Uh, 
All right, we're just going to go for it. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Fox and Dr. Isaac. Um, you mentioned, both of you, this process of how do we increase the ability to, well, just hospitality and reconciliation. And so as one of many in this room who are working towards educating our future um, group of physicians, what are some of the, you mentioned knowledge, skills, and attitudes that would help them actually address the system disparities. And we're just in the thick of that right now, trying to do that. And so I would just love to hear from your experience both of you actually, just what are some of those key qualities, both that are inherent and that can be taught? Um, and how do we teach that to our future generation? So the, it's a great question. Um, I, I wish that I had a more well-developed answer. So again, I think it, it begins with, um, who has access to medical education? Uh, you know, our our medical school admissions classes remain, you know, socioeconomically skewed, um, and so don't reflect the populations that we serve. So that that remains one challenge. And so, given the the community that we are teaching, how how do we provide an experience that? shakes them up, if you will, or, you know, that gives them some of that, the experiences that will promote reflection and introspection and, and foster commitment. So, um, you know, we strive to incorporate a number of different ways to engage students in the community. So in Tulsa, you know, they, they tried to engage and understand the history of the Tulsa race massacre. Where I am in Indiana, we engage with the community in a variety of ways, including a poverty simulation. Um, that for many students is really eye-opening and, and invites conversation for, with students who grew up in different circumstances. So um, to this point, those have been some really moving opportunities to provide insight. But I also think there are a host of, of structural challenges that unfortunately I feel like until you experience them that you experience them, you don't appreciate them. So for instance, I have really advanced arthritis in my hand. And when I go to the trouble to fill out a form online and I go to the doctor's office and they give me a stack of forms and say, fill this out. And I said, I filled it out online. You know, again, this is coming from a position of privilege. And when I think about language barriers and also the number of times we fill out the same information on forms over and over and over again, that people just put up with. Um, I experienced that as fundamentally disrespectful. And I just recognize that the experience of care um, for many people is that just gets amplified. Uh, but I think until, um, until people confront that and experience it and, and really walk through what is the patient experience of care to find to begin to appreciate all the ways that that they are marginalized once they get in the system is one challenge. And then there's very little insight. And I think it remains a big challenge to think about how do we more effectively engage all those who never even get to the starting line. I agree. Um, to put it succinctly, whenever I teach health disparities, the first question I get or response I get is, I did not know. And the I did not know for me means that majority of students are unfamiliar with the lived experiences of people who are different from their own. And if that is the case, then there needs to be greater education, greater research, and I think a more rigorous curriculum that incorporates these type of issues as a part of the curriculum. Thank you, Dr. Fox, for your presentation. It was a narrative, not a highfalutin presentation. I must confess, I really hadn't thought of hospitality as part of the healthcare system. But as I think about hospitality, it seems to me that it's very similar to what we call at Loma Linda, whole person care. And I wonder if you'd like to address that. And number two, 
your office people, your front office, your back office people, they've got to buy into this. How do you get that? Yeah, thank you for that observation. So if I remember right, you, your specialty was maternal fetal medicine? Yes, sir. So when you, when you think about how birthing units have been redesigned over the last generation and a half, um, you know, at some level that is a, a nod to hospitality, trying to create welcoming, inviting, comfortable spaces but they may look different for an insured population than they do for others. So it's not uniform across the board, which is regrettable. Um, but I, I do think it, it speaks to at least some attempt and some understanding of hospitality misguided though it, or incomplete as it may be, I should say. Um, you know, I've just learned a little bit over the last day and a half uh, about Loma Linda and kind of the approach to whole person care. So, you know, I think the people who train here and are exposed to that uh, as kind of a philosophical commitment, hopefully are a leg up on most of us training students in secular institutions that may not have uh, embraced that same focus at an institutional level. So I think the institutions remain a challenge to contend with and, and the structure of medical education remains a challenge. While I have the microphone, I just want to mention that you talked about hypertension, diabetes, and, and obesity in these communities. The evidence is very strong that epigenetics shows that the origin of many of these chronic diseases occurred in the womb. And that to me underscores how important good prenatal care is. And how do you get that prenatal care to people who don't have access? No, that's a great point. And you know, I didn't go into detail in, in the work on ACEs and the effect on epigenetics, um, but certainly, you know, chronic toxic stress has lifelong health implications that I, you know, my sister is uh, a sociologist and she kind of smirks when she says, you know, physicians think that they discovered the idea of social determinants of health. And that's what her, her life work has been focused on. Um, so she gives me a hard time at the Thanksgiving table. Um, access to prenatal care is critically important. And you know, I think the epigenetic phenomena are are critically important. The flip side of adverse childhood experiences is also something that I'm really attracted to because we know that, you know, a history of trauma and exposure to adverse experiences is associated with decreased attachment and decreased trust in the medical profession. And that decreased trust in the medical profession is associated with more missed appointments and poor adherence to medical regimen and later entry into screening um, services and into cancer treatment, for instance, so a variety of factors. And prenatal care is another area where there are very interesting um, disparities along racial and ethnic lines that we still grapple with. So in St. Joseph County, the uh, infant mortality rate among African Americans is three times higher than the white community. And yet the Hispanic population has better outcomes, even with poorer access to prenatal care. Um, so I, again, I think the phenomena are, are fascinating and I don't have a great uh, resolution to it. Thank you, Dr. Isaac and Dr. Fox for your presentations. Um, I think Dr. Fox, my question kind of tags along with your comment about uh, teaching uh, these ideas in a secular context. So I guess, um, you know, these concepts of hospitality, reconciliation, I think both of you draw from, from scripture and theology, I think speak very powerfully to most of us who, uh, you know, come from a faith background or tradition. I'm just kind of wondering if I, we could hear your, your experiences of, of trying to present these ideas to audiences or people who don't share uh, these assumptions are, is, you know, how does, 
are there analog concepts or narratives or resources that can be drawn? Or maybe these ideas just speak for themselves. But I was wondering if you could kind of speak on uh, the translation of these to other audiences. And I guess if I could tag along, what could we do, those of us who are located in these traditions that you're drawing on, to do the translation work you're doing for us um, you know, better and more explicitly? So I guess it's a twofold question. Yeah, I appreciate the question because, again, the, even though I'm theologically trained, I have spent most of my academic life in state institutions where we can't talk. Um, and so it almost of necessity becomes a somewhat sanitized conversation. And so how do you um, raise the concepts in a way that, you know, is palatable or doesn't raise hackles. And so I generally try to begin with the experience of care and the ways that it is inhospitable. And it's easy to do that obviously with language and health literacy, and then trying to extend that and encourage students and residents to think about, you know, the whole host of other ways that people are alienated. Again, as I said a moment ago, before they even get to the starting line. Um, so what has, you know, how do we change care seeking behavior? The Affordable Care Act certainly opened up access to health insurance to a lot more people without necessarily fundamentally changing their care seeking behavior. And so um, trying to ask them to approach it from, from that perspective. I'd be interested in Dr. Isaac has other comments. Um, not in particular to, because uh, I don't I haven't taught um, these subjects in a, um, a secular uh, institution or society. But what I would say is there are certain universals to the human experience, and I think it is important to target these universals, um, even if one has to divest them of their theological packaging, um, and to get to the core of this human experience that we all can feel. Um, compassion, love. I mean, even outside of the religious context, I'm sure there's someone who has loved you and showed you compassion in your life. Um, and so just getting to the root of what is essentially universal for all of us. Um, and then from there, I would say, uh, broach the other aspects that are relative to that topic. This, has, this will be our last question. Uh, th thank you both for your presentations. Um, I think that the answer in part to the disparity issue is the need for us to have much more profoundly social concern and delivery of healthcare. And, and that means taxing the wealthy and, and having intelligent programs for addressing those things. And I'm all for that on humanitarian and Christian bases. To, to, to me, that's hardly controversial. I wish you would, though, address this issue, and that is the fact that, according to Steven Pinker, who has recently, a few years ago, published a book showing, contrary to much popular opinion, that live, many more lives are saved today because of various uh, measures that we take, in, in, including less deadly wars than ever in history. Uh, but still more needs to be done. But what do you do with the fact that there are, um, and, and because of what you've said, uh, Dr. Fox, it looks like you're dealing with these sort of people, there must be intractable sort of cases. I mean, the, the people who come from these trauma-ridden homes, who have poor mental health, perhaps related, maybe not, don't have good nutrition, don't have good role models. And, and, and because of all of that, they can't see the vision for, for a better life. Uh, it, it must be heart-rending and dispiriting because of the number of those individuals that exist. I mean, we could go downtown LA and see the homeless and, and some choose to live in tents when they 
they have come from uh, cottages up in the high desert. There was a, a Times piece uh, on that just the other day. Um, and, and surely these sort of individuals existed throughout history. It seems sometimes, Dr. Isaac, we hold up hospitality in 2000 years ago, like it was a better day. I, I question that. Uh, not saying that we're good today, but what do we do with some of these intractable situations? Uh, Again, a, a, another great question and really a devastating challenge. Um, you know, my, I tried to suggest a notion of proactive hospitality, which doesn't quite get at it because um, I think some of the efforts that can be beneficial is community outreach uh, involving people with similar lived experience. Um, but as you, suggests some of the chronically homeless individuals, many may have mental health or substance abuse issues or other circumstances that have, have led to them being disenfranchised and rejecting most institutional forms of intervention. Um, and so I think the, the interim compromise step and again, we dealt with this throughout the pandemic is how do we take measures to protect individuals, you know, living in those circumstances, uh, protect their health, protect the health of the community in which they're gathered and, you know, respect the choices that they've made and, and preserve their dignity in doing that where sanitation and physical distancing and other things can, remain a challenge in, you know, battling a pandemic. Um, I didn't encounter a perfect response in, in any of the communities that I worked with, um, but, you know, it's, it's a devastating challenge, certainly in a pandemic, but as we emerge from the crisis mode of a pandemic, it will remain an ongoing challenge and, and you know, access to housing with few constraints, I think is an important first step that many communities are not willing or able to, to take, unfortunately. In my neighborhood, uh, there are probably three elementary schools. And I remember one day as I was passing by one of them, I saw first, second, third grade black and Latino kids playing in the playground. And I asked myself, I wonder if anyone has come to the school, a doctor, a clinician to inspire the next generation. I don't know the answer to that question, but for me, I think it gets back to how things can change. Studies have shown that doctors who um, emerge from impoverished communities a lot of times go back to these communities to serve. And I believe they create a chain link that needs to continue to be forged. It is by inspiring, as I looked at the playground, these future doctors and healthcare professionals, inspiring them at this early level is where I think you can start to see more changes. Um, and that's gonna impact, of course, enrollment at medical schools, scholarships, et cetera, and things of that nature. But it is it starts at the ground level. A lot of them come from poor families where um, no one is a healthcare professional. They don't know a black doctor or a Latin doctor or a Spanish speaking doctor. Um, they don't have a family member that they can talk to who can tell them the ropes, show them the ropes and, and how the pathway has been paved. A lot, for a lot of them, um, they are the first graduates of high school and college and graduate school. And so I think it's important to inspire the new generation 
by having the current generation be more active in these communities of color. A warm thank you to uh, Dr. Fox for joining us from Indiana and Dr. Isaac for offering your critical reflections. And both of you, thank you all for joining us this afternoon, taking time out of your busy schedules uh, for this event. So this concludes the Provencia lecture. Thank you so much. <laughs>